end of 1914 were acquiring a squalid permanence. Haphazard sections of trench were deepened and joined to each other. Drains were scooped in the mud. Holes in the ground had been converted into dugouts. They were at least splinter-proof, which meant much to an army fighting an artillery war. The soldiers knew something must happen soon. A French dragoon wrote, In spring, the benumbed army stirred itself, stretched its legs, and awoke to the fact that a new era was about to begin. The change took place with the greatest mystery. Rumors, coming no one knew where from, began to circulate. The basic question of 1915 was, could the Allies break through the German defensive works? Lord Kitchener expressed the widespread doubts. I suppose we must recognize that the French army cannot make a sufficient break through the German lines of defense to cause a complete change of the situation. The German lines in France may be looked upon as a fortress that cannot be carried by assault. But the Germans left General Joff, the French commander-in-chief, with no choice. The best and largest portion of the German army was on our soil, with its line of battle jutting out a mere five days' march from the heart of France. This situation made it clear to every Frenchman that our task consisted in defeating this enemy and driving him out of our country. But how? observers peered at the German front line. Week by week, month by month, battle by battle, the Germans had strengthened and deepened their defensive position. From behind the trenches, the gun flashes told the Allies of the power and numbers of the artillery supporting the German soldiers. The answer, the French concluded, lay in artillery and high explosive shell. Given enough, the infantry would merely occupy German defences already ploughed up and made harmless. In the words of Sir Douglas Haig, commanding the British First Army, When there were sufficient shells, we could walk through the German lines in several places. But were there sufficient shells, sufficient gunpowder? When war broke out, France had only 300 heavy guns to oppose 3,500 German medium and heavy guns. Since then, only 48 new heavies had been delivered, and 18 of those had blown up in the gunners' faces. Now, in a desperate attempt to catch up, they were pressing into service the old, slow-firing big guns stripped from fortresses like Verdun and Toul. The BEF by the first half of 1915 had only 10 heavy guns per division against the German 20. Incidentally, every time our artillery opened up on them at that particular time, they would come back tenfold. If our artillery fired about five or six rounds, they'd fire 50 to 60 back at us. But all was it was that unequal bashing that, that got the infantrymen. But we couldn't, if we'd got a gun at all, we had a machine gun, it's true, but... Uh, that was only a puny effort. It was these colossal shells that rained on and on, and we could do nothing about it. The earthworks and the barbed wire, such as they were, had been blown to pieces long since. And the result was that practically the whole of the front line around the town of Ypres was a series of holes in which men crouched and waited for the end. In February, Sir John French rationed his heavies to eight rounds a day and his field guns to ten for ordinary purposes. A British gunner wrote to Lloyd George, We don't know or care who is to blame, 
We only know that we are being starved to death for want of shells, and our infantry are being fated daily to a more and more terrible task. Trench mortars and mine throwers were lacking too. The soldiers of the country that thought itself the workshop of the world were reduced to homemade equipment. They invented the hairbrush grenade, a slab of gun cotton fastened to a piece of wood and lit with a match or cigarette. There was also a jam tin filled with shredded gun cotton and nails. Some units improvised trench mortars. A corporal said to me, come along here, we're going to let our mortar, come and have a look at it. It was a homemade mortar. It looked to me like a piece of rainwater pipe, and it was bound all round with what appeared to be a leather throng to take the resistance. There was a plate bolted on the back and a touch hole with a piece of fuse in it. The charge was a screw of gunpowder in a paper screw, and the bomb was a jam tin filled with explosive. They lit the fuse and all stood well away. Well, the bomb just went off, whizzed over, tumbled over two or three times and dropped somewhere near the German trench and went off with a big bang. The French had to improvise too. In some parts of the country, the manufacture of munitions became a cottage industry. the day of the Allied offensives approached, the shell shortage remained desperate at the British base depot. It was the base ammunition depot for the southern armies, and it was, I suppose, an ex-builder's yard. It consisted of about a couple of sheds, room to put a couple of railway trucks or wagons in, and the total stock couldn't have exceeded about 2,000 rounds of ammunition of all kinds. We used to issue it in half dozens, dozens, and sometimes single rounds to some of the bigger batteries. And I suppose one day's loading would be a couple of railway trucks. And of course, it was perfectly absurd. The ammunition we had was treated as if it were gold ingots. It was laid out in very neat rows. It had to be counted every day, and lined every day, and dusted every day. Early in 1915, the Allies began a series of attacks to wear down and soften the German defences. Suddenly, a thunderclap right beside us. An enormous fountain of black smoke seems to spring out of the ground, hurling hundreds of clods up to the sky, and they rain down like hailstones on our heads. It's a heavy melanite shell just a few feet away. We run in all directions. Then, one by one, we recover. The French spring offensives cost them 240,000 men, killed or wounded. On March the 10th, the British attacked at Neuve-Chapelle. There were enough hoarded shells to smash the German front-line trench, but the German second line was not destroyed. The attack could go no further. On April the 6th, the French attacked at saint Miel to pinch out the German salient. They failed. But these were only preliminary attacks. The real attempt to break through the German defences was planned for May. But it was the Germans who attacked on April the 22nd. Their purpose was to cover up their troop movements away from the Western Front to gorlitz tarnow Against the French sector at Ypres, they let loose a hideous new weapon, which science had added to the German soldier's armory. Poison gas. On about four o'clock in the afternoon, there was a very heavy bombardment started. And a little later on, we saw the effects of this. The first thing was hundreds of French troops running away. They were just like ants. They weren't sticking to roads or paths or anything else. They were all over the fields and breaking through hedges and everything. 